Okay, just start? Okay. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the, the first edition of a new invention in the Art Basel Talks program. Um, Andres and I had a conversation a little while ago about how these talks would go, and he said, we really want to flip the script. We want to break the format. We want to do something very different. Um, and it's not just that neither Alec nor I are formally dressed, you know, on this beautiful <laughs> Saturday morning, but um, it's also that it's supposed to be really a conversation not so much that you watch as that you take part in. Um, and obviously we don't have a table big enough for everyone to sit here, but um, I was thinking about how we could do this, and, and normally if someone gives me an hour to speak by myself, I'll say I'll speak for half an hour and then I'll take questions for half an hour, because in the end, I think what's most interesting is the dialogue between the audience and the speakers. And um, in the same way, I think it's, that's the only way that we can ensure, at some level, that you walk away with your questions being answered. So I was thinking some more about this concept of flipping the script. And I said, well, let's flip the script completely and start with questions from the audience. So now. <laughs> It's not just us that have to work this morning, it's also you that have to work this morning. Um, and I, I thought this would work for a couple of reasons. One is I think we have obviously a highly engaged audience, but also I think because Alec and I, between us, I think cover the broad spectrum of, of art and tech. You know, Alec is, is obviously a tech entrepreneur, but an arts patron and a collector. Um, I'm someone who, uh, you know, works with artists, works with galleries in the digital sphere. In fact, I, and I just remember this, I was even once a digital artist. I was a registered artist at Ars Electronica in roughly 2000 as part of a digital narrative process. So, so I'm even in some weird and obscure and far distant way a digital artist. So we have everything from like artist, gallerist, landlord, gallerist, helper, um, you know, uh, obviously Art Basel has a strong digital presence. I'm just running out time so you can generate questions. So you better be working for me. <laughs> Um, and so I think, you know, there's, I, I like to think there's almost no question that Alec and I couldn't take a reasonable first stab at answering on this very, very broad spectrum of art meeting tech. Because I think when you look at art and tech, you know, at the one end you have how does technology affect the creation of art? And then at the other end you have how does the technology affect the, the displaying of art? You know, both for collectors but also for museums. I think museums, in a lot of ways, have been one of the few truly progressive forces within the art world, which, generally speaking, has been quite reactionary in terms of embracing tech, um, at least compared to other industries. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think we'll, we should be able to get some good questions from the audience. And I'm going to give you a couple more minutes by giving the microphone to Alec. So, and then we'll expect questions from the audience. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is the first time for me. <coughs> I'm used to <coughs> talking about it, kind of e-commerce and internet stuff and being an entrepreneur in the tech world, but I've never actually, even, even though as, as Mark said, I'm, I'm a big art lover and I'm an art collector and I try to, I try to help. Is this not working? Uh, it's only for him. Uh, okay. So yeah. we have to Sorry. project. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I was saying that I'm, I'm more used to talking to, to people about my ventures, you know, my, I'm an internet entrepreneur and I've been, I've been an internet entrepreneur for 20 years or so. Not so much used to talking about art and technology, although I understand art, as I'm very curious and just understand it as, as a collector, a very curious collector, um, and to some degree an, an, an art patron, or at least a, you know, that, that's a goal sometimes. But I find it very interesting to debate these topics and hopefully something will, will, will come from it. So don't expert super academic intellectual answers to any questions you pose, but you'll have an honest um, observation from somebody who cares about the topic. So, so it's to lower expectations. Yeah. <laughs> we say that's the key to, to having a good outcome. Okay. Great. Okay, so let's start. Who has a question about art? Anything about art and technology? Vicky. Ah, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> that's going to be hard. <laughs> I'm going, to I'm going to repeat the question just because this is being videotaped and you guys don't all have microphones. I guess the question to summarize it is, is there a disruptive technology, a disruptive platform that's going to come and either disrupt 
it, in the good sense of uplifting or destroy the system as we know it. Um, and so, hopefully in, an hopefully in an optimistic way. Well, you said, are we in a safe place? <laughs> so it makes me, it implies, this reminds me of one of my favorite quotes um, from Mark Twain, which is, everybody wants change, uh, progress, nobody wants change. Yeah. Um, and obviously, as, as a tech entrepreneur, you face this a lot. Alec, do you want to take a first shot at that? Fine. Um, I think technology impacts our be human behavior and everything we do collectively and individually. But it does so, even though we, we like to believe it's extremely dis disruptive and it changes everything, I'm, I believe that technology just follows our collective level of consciousness. Kind of the technology appears when it is, um, when it can actually be used better by at least parts of, of society. So when we are ready to engage more with others, then social networks, networks appear. And, and it becomes, that, that's why they're so natural. And, th and that's why people endorse them so quickly. And if, they, if the technology appears too early, then it just doesn't get adopted, yeah. as an example. There was a, we all, we all know and have used YouTube. However, there was a predecessor of YouTube that came up in Germany four years before YouTube. For whatever reason, people were not ready for it. Nobody used it. Nobody knows about it. It wasn't relevant. YouTube appeared afterwards. And so when we talk about the art world, I already think that there are very significant small disruptions happening uh, that, that come from technology. The one I believe is probably the more relevant one is the acceleration of the idealization to consumption process of art. And let me explain what I mean by that. In the, until the mid-90s, um, we would, if we were in a city or a country where art was kind of prevalent, um, you would have normal cycles. And the cycles would be, you would have monthly exhibitions, and then you would have annual art fairs, and you would have biennials, okay? Just to simplify. And then, in turn, media, print media, would follow that. You would have daily newspapers, and you would have monthly publications, and then some catalogs, which would be annual. And as a consequence of that process, the experts, the critics, the curators would look at the information, would produce feedback. That feedback would get back into the system. An artist and gallerist would then connect, and new art would come up, and it would appear the second year. And, and, and that way, you know, this was a very, to some degree, it was much more uh, serious and much more, um, eh, it involves more experts than the situation today. So what, what changed? You go today and sometimes before an exhibition is, is totally you know, hung, you're gonna see uh, people just, you know, even maybe the people just walking around will take pictures, the pictures will be on the social networks, and there will instantaneously be comments about what's going on. Very often, attention, collective attention, will not follow the critics' uh, points of view. Things that become more relevant in the social networks are not necessarily those that are believed to be the more important ones by the critics. Now, the problem is what the feedback then that goes to the galleries and back to the artists who in turn adjust and continue producing art. I tend to believe the more relevant feedback today is collective attention and just what, and that comes from, from society through technology via social networks impacting the process, much less, uh, much more than what used to be the case um, where society in general had very little say, you know, in terms of that feedback loop, loop with yeah. artisan production. Now, the, the main technology here is a combination of the iPhone, which for the first time allowed um, high resolution images um, you know, to be easily seen by millions of people, the critical mass of iPhones with a bigger screen, and, um, and the web that allows to, to share that. I, I think that that acceleration has, to a large degree, reduced the power of the art institutions, the critics, the curators, and has increased the power of people who just like or dislike what they see. And I, th I think that's the biggest trend we see. But personal opinion 
observation could be completely wrong. <laughs> I mean, I, I share many of Alex's points, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't need to repeat those. I think, you know, when we think about, and I'll talk about, about a very specific technology, I would say the single most effective disruptive platform is Instagram um, because it's built to make images viral, much more so than any of the art specific platforms. I think Instagram has a huge impact. And I think, um, you know, when we talk about technology, I think all, the question is always to use the tool or does the tool use you? And the answer is, is usually yes in, in the sense that it works in both ways. So when we think about the impact of Instagram, I think, um, you know, on the good side, it means that, uh, that images can go very quickly viral and that people who might never have seen or heard about a show hear about it. Um, and for people who use it successfully, it means that more people come to see the show and more people come to museums. I think, you know, social media is a really, really powerful thing for museums. It's also a very powerful thing for galleries in, in the good sense that people are actually selling work using Instagram. People are putting images online and then they're getting direct messages saying, you know, I'd like to see that, how much is it, et cetera. So from a promotional standpoint, it's great, but it does have a danger, it has many dangers, and I won't go into all of them, but I mean, think a couple of examples. One is, for example, um, I remember going to see Eduardo Leme a few years ago, and he was telling me about the problem he had with one of his artists, that every time she made a work, she'd take a picture in the studio, and collectors would start calling up and asking to buy a work that he didn't even know existed unless he was constantly monitoring her feed. The other thing, and this is a point that I have to attribute to Ed Winkleman, who's a former gallerist and a real, a, one of the great... Sure, sorry, that's fine. <laughs> and, she's very, and she's very good, I know. Yeah. The, other, the, other, the other point, and I have to attribute it to Ed Winkleman, who's a great gal a former gallerist and a great intellectual about this, is that we all expected Instagram to disrupt, or we all expected the, the digital to greatly disrupt the process of buying art. And it really hasn't done that. There's no Airbnb um, or, or Uber for art. On the other hand, what it has done in terms of the gallerist is to take them very much out of the monopoly position of informing a collector about what an artist does. You know, even, I mean, artists are putting a lot of things online. I mean, um, other people are putting a lot of things online. I think if you want to get a sense of what an artist is doing, the first thing you might do is to feed their, their name into Instagram as a hashtag or into Google. Yeah. And so in that sense, you know, there has been a disintermediation, but it's not about commerce, it's about information flow. Yeah, yeah the, the, this discovery has moved away from galleries to the iPhone, basically, again. Yeah. I just use the iPhone because, I, and then Instagram within the iPhone is, is, is the most prevalent, I, I had prevalent a, oh, sorry. way to get in. But, but, I mean, we've seen over and over how galleries around the world have become less relevant. Many are closing, it's like, uh, only the very big ones have been actually more successful, uh, I think, in, in the last 10 years. Um, and it's because people don't, don't have a lot of time to actually spend there. We, we, used, we expect instant, an instantaneous assessment of uh, a piece of, of art, and the only way to do that is, is via our phones. Um, this is actually, I think this is one of the, one of the big, big changes that, that will impact our future, so much so that uh, there's a guy called Michael uh, Sanchez who wrote an article in the Art Forum, and he says that he started to identify that um, a trend in terms of the way art pieces look, yeah. and he said that some of the art that is being produced today <coughs> is either art that um, when you're scrolling, you know, in your phone, stands out. For example, neon, strong colors, yeah very inorganic shapes, or uh, on, on the one end, on the other end is stuff that is um, gray shades, very smooth. It's like therapeutic uh, yeah. visually because it, it, so our brain gets so uh, cluttered by all the noise we see all, all the time. So there's only two ways to stand out. You are completely zen or you are even more noisy. And he says that art is increasingly either very, very sane and minimalistic and gray and, and, you know, clean and all the rest, or it's very chaotic and super exuberant and very <coughs> neon type. And he says that that is happening, he claims, to some degree, because of the way we are consuming art more and more has to do with this scrolling, where we take yeah. two and a half seconds per piece. That's the, all, all the assessment we'll ever give to that. 
piece with it before deciding what we do with it. The, so the question, the I question, I know it is right, yeah. but it's interesting. The, the, question, the question here is to what degree is that a conscious process and to what degree is that a subconscious process? In the sense that there are, are certainly people who are, who are deliberately making work that l looks good on Instagram. It's square and it's colorful. Mm -hmm. But there are also people, I think, who in a very subconscious way are ingesting the social media feedback and, and without being conscious of it, changing their art. In the same way, and this is something that we know psychologically, if every time I put my arm over here, you all started looking at your phones, and every time I put my arm over here, you all started smiling and looking engaged, by the end of the lecture, I would be like this, without <laughs> consciously doing this. So the point is that I think you almost, in, like with so many things, a good artist has to consciously resist the social media feedback that they're getting. But an artist who wants to sell a lot of work and doesn't care about mm -hmm. the quality of it has to understand exactly how to make their work look great on Instagram. Should we take a second question since the first question had a 10 minute answer? <laughs> you go first. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a, it's a big topic and I'll repeat the question, which is, you know, what are the platforms or let's say types of platforms that could have an impact on things like democratizing, uh, democratizing collecting, um, issues around logistics, issues around authenticity. I mean, I'll give answers to all three of those. I mean, first of all, I think the notion that you're gonna democratize art through the internet is completely bogus because the problem, the, what makes art, the art collecting undemocratic is not a access to information, it's access to capital. So, you know, you can, you can make less expensive art and people have tried to do that, but you know, the fact that I know a Basquiat exists doesn't mean I can buy it. So let's not, let's get off the notion of democratizing collecting. We can democratize access to art and that's already happening. Um, the next question is more like, um, I mean, yeah, you can make endless cheap multiples. For, you know, and for example, the, the, ocean, the notion of an, of an endless edition is something that we saw in Japanese photography, for example. Mm -hmm. People like Araki and Daido Moriyama and, those, and, and such photographers have done endless editions. And you can do that. There's a company called Sedition, which does sort of little editions. But you also have this existing already in other forms where you have artists who are deliberately making huge editions so that their friends can buy them for 200 bucks and not 20,000 bucks. But again, you know, it doesn't change the fundamental fact, that the internet doesn't change the fundamental fact that the market as it's structured now is about creating manufactured scarcity and selling objects at high prices so that artists don't have to function as factories and produce huge multiples. Um, so the, the other thing you said, you know, things like freighting and shipment, like there's a company called Arta, which, which, is, which is sort of an Expedia for freighting, for, for shipping of art which just was launched. Um, and then the last one was authenticity. I mean, uh, the reality is this, the only person who knows art, an artwork is authentic is the gallerist and the artist, you know, and, and, and there have been various examples of how to do this. Uh, one is to do things like an authenticity thing, which is based upon the DNA of the artist. The other is to do like an incredibly high resolution photo, which then turns it into a, a piece of blockchain code, et cetera. So, I mean, yes, this, there's absolutely the possibility that you could use this to control authenticity of works. The problem being that if the, the, the authenticating device is not literally physically inlaid into the artwork, there's nothing that's gonna stop you from faking a work and then tying it to the authentic, authenticating document. Um, unless we're talking about uh, digital pieces, um, which you can turn on and off, but we know that, that almost any piece of code can be hacked. So I don't think the digital solves these problems easily. Things like logistics, information flow, et cetera, yes. Authenticity is a super tricky issue. And the reality is that the majority of the problematic authentication cases no, don't have to do with work coming out of the studio, but with work which is several hundred years old. You know, so you could, you could do a catalog raisonné and you could say like, these Picassos are legitimate and we're gonna tag each one of them and anything that's not tagged in this way is not considered legitimate. Which, as we know from the history of catalog raisonné, is not as simple as it sounds. Alec? Yeah. Uh a few observations. The first one is, um, if, if we look at I mean, what, what has really been happening in terms of the use of technology in the production or consumption or distribution of art, most of the uses have been um, to use technology as a tool. So uh, there's been the photoshopping and the videoing and the merging of technologies and the digitali digi digitalizing of parts of the process. But it's not really a, 
a, a big essential debate about, for example, how technology is impacting history or how technology is impacting our, ourselves. It's like a very superficial use of technology in the art world so far. As a tool, for example, distribution would also be one of those tools. Now, when you actually get to the essence of the art piece, I think that to some degree there's been a, an underlying reactionary approach to this, which, which you can see in the, um, in, 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 to, the, to the extent to which an analog art, which is uh, discrete, it's scarce, it's considered warmer, is usually more valuable than digital art, which is, you know, infinitely replicable, colder, and considered cheaper. If, if you ask a focus group and you show them, you know, digital art and you show, show them something traditional, sculpture, just an analog art, just to, everybody would assume digital, cheap, infinite, not scarce, not really valuable, analog, valuable, um, scarce, um, important, relevant. It, it's, it's <laughs> so, um, and I don't know whether that will change eventually, but today that's clearly, clearly the case. Um, with regards to um, distribution, um, there's all kinds of hypotheses, and people are just, uh, are, I mean, does, does the, Google has a very cool project, um, all big museums have online pages, and now the degree to which visiting an online page of the Guggenheim or, or Mamba, it, the degree to, what, to which that experience um, can, um, can be comparable to actually visiting and experiencing an art piece um, in reality is, is very unclear. So some will say the argument for actually having an online distribution is, well, much better to actually see something than see nothing. But there's a, an increasing um, consensus that is a very different experience to actually be in front of a, a piece yeah. of art than it is to actually watch that same piece in a, on a screen. And, and, and there's something, even the Vatican has I actually I participated in a, there's something called the Vatican Arts and Council, Arts and Technology Council. And, and, and their mission is to actually uh, distribute digitally the thousands of pieces of art that the Vatican has that, that are not visible in, in the museums in, in the Vatican, that you cannot visit. They, they, they have them in storage and they want to make them publicly available. But then there was this huge debate there because very quickly they, they, the, the, the discussion turned philosophical and almost spiritual and people just, they, the, 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 the priests involved in the process were completely convinced that it's not the same to watch, watch at the frescoes in the Sistine Chapel and, and to watch a postcard of the Sistine it's, it's a completely different experience and therefore actually some said it does a negative, it doesn't help. It, 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 it goes directly against the essence of that work piece to completely reduce it to a screen or a, or a postcard. So it, it's, it's a very contentious, I'm, I'm gonna, complicated I'm, problem. I'm going to give a, a both a negative, an, an optimistic and a, a pessimistic take on that because I think it's, you know, digital, the digitalization of music did not destroy live music. It destroyed record companies, right? I mean, bands now can become famous overnight and they can use the digital as a way to steer a large audience to their crowd, sell more t-shirts, et cetera, et cetera. What they don't do is make a lot of money for record companies with rights because the, the stuff is all over the internet. So I actually think that when museums do it right, you know, and we'll, we see this, you know, the Tate and MoMA and the Met have never had broader, broader audiences than since the beginning of the digital era. This is clearly not killing museum attendance. That being said, the problem is that while social media may drive people into museums and galleries when they're there, they're in CPA, continuous partial attention. They are in the museum and they are doing their email and they're taking pictures and they're doing selfies. If I could ban selfies at my fairs, I would. Um, because A, I don't think any artist makes a painting so they can be a backdrop for someone's miniskirt photo, but also because it takes people out of the process of, of communing with art and leaves them in the, the process of communing with themselves. Just w one last sentence on that. Uh, two weeks ago, I participated in a forum in Berlin con called the Berlin Future Forum. And there was actually a session on arts and technology. And one of the participants, speakers, said that uh, he had a, like a, 
quantum physics approach to the topic. And she says that every, everything actually has a vibration. Even stones have vibrations. Yeah. But artworks have a very strong vibration. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different vibration, the one that comes out of a, an, an art piece than the one that comes out of a cell phone. So yeah. he says it's just completely different. And, and therefore, even though visually um, we might see something similar, the experience uh, for our soul is completely different. And it, I understand it's, liter it's, it's literally it's, flat. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. so it's, it's, it's complicated. Yeah. Again, I think um, the question is, does consuming shows before we even see them digitally make them less powerful to us, which I think is the case. On the other hand, perhaps we would never have seen those shows if we hadn't been aware of them because of the digital. I think yeah. the hard part for us is to make sure that we don't let the digital take the wrong part of our soul away. There's a whole argument among sociologists who study relationships that dating apps actually make people less able to have relationships because there's always an easy, when things get a little tough, you can always find 17 other people who want to have drinks with you, you know, and I think there's a danger that we kind of, that the soul gets destroyed in the process. But I will say that I think, um, you know, I, I work in the fair business and a, a fair booth is not the same thing as a gallery. It doesn't have the same architecture. It's not installed in the same way. Um, and yet, fairs function very well as a kind of gateway towards the galleries themselves. And I think in the same way, if played correctly and also if we're conscious of how, how much we let it affect us, um, the digital can be something which allows us to have a richer relationship with art. But we have to be, you know, like simple thing, turn your damn phone off when you walk into a gallery. <laughs> take pic or take pictures at the end. This is something I try to do a lot. I'm not good about it, but often I try to turn my phone off not, and just walk around and then take a second loop and people think I'm crazy because I'm sprinting through and taking like pictures of the six images that I thought were most interesting. Um, but I think we have to have conscious mechanisms for how we don't let the digital destroy our relationship with art. Simon? Summarize it. Basically the question is, you know, does the fact that Art Basel is extending itself physically to another region, you know, by doing Art Basel cities in Buenos Aires, mean that we see a different, that we have a different view of how art, art is extended through the digital. And I think um, it's both. I don't, you know, when I started Art Basel, the, the institution was afraid of the digital. You know, we had, we would briefly put a catalog of works online two weeks after the fair so that no one would not come because they'd seen everything beforehand. And it was a map where you would literally click on a floor plan and you could see a few images. And then after a month, it would disappear. Um, today, every fair sees galleries putting thousands of images online. We have something like, I think we'll have about 30,000 images in the online catalog of works that were at the fair and you can see them ahead of the fair. Um, so I think, you know, the digital creates a lot of momentum ahead of the fair and a lot of long tail infinitely after the fair. Um, but I mean, in the end, you know, I think the digital and physical have to interact. You know, I think you have to, you have to be smart about how you use the digital as a way to promote things and make people aware of things, but it doesn't replace the experience at all. And I think, you know, we firmly believe that one of the great things about fairs is that they're not only sales platforms, but also places where people meet each other, you know, and, and you know, this week, these few days here in Buenos Aires, thousands of connections have been made and those will result in shows, those result in new artworks, those will result in new collections starting eventually or people starting to collect art from this region. And that's not something you can, you can replace because the reality is that um, the art world, the art market is, is exceptionally social and exceptionally physical and exceptionally based upon trust of the people you're buying from and selling to, and it is exceptionally based upon perception. And because it's, it's based on perception, trust is key. There's no utility value to buying art. And so in that sense, I think, you know, we strongly believe that as important as the digital is, the physical remains crucial. You know, we don't do, you know, next week, Noah, Noah Horowitz is going to New Orleans for the new, to do a, a cocktail for the people who are attending the New Orleans Biennial Prospect, you know, and I think um, that's, there's a reason why we're going there. There's a reason why we want to see people see the work. You know, there's a reason why Noah and I ran around and saw almost two dozen spaces and galleries in the last few days, because we want to see the works in person. We want to see the spaces in person. We want to see that Isla Flotante, a gallery which is doing Art Basel Miami Beach for the first time in December, we want to see that it's like this, this gallery that's in the middle of this really weird area, and that it's just like IF. 
spray painted on the door. And that says something very different than being in the bottom floor of a skyscraper in an office park. And I think that's the thing you can't understand if you don't see things in person. Also, frankly, seeing art, talking to people about art is one of the great pleasures of being part of the art world. So if you digitize that, you lose the magic. Yeah. There's a, just to, to complement on the physicality, the relevance of physicality. Um, you know, there's in Latin America and here in Buenos Aires, we have, um, we have like favelas, you know, it's very poor, like shantytown places. And um, often, in, uh, very unfortunately, in, in some of them, um, there's a lot of drug consumption, very cheap drug consumption, particularly one called Paco, and in particular, um, the younger population, kids in school ages. And there's a um, foundation called Realizarte, which um, targets that constituency, young uh, kids, school age, young school age, who are actually impacted by drugs. And one of the approaches they've used, actually successful, successful in one of them in, um, in, in Escobar, near, near a very cool neighborhood called Nordelta, but actually beside it. And what they did is they brought art pieces and they just left them there. And so what happened? And quite amazingly, drug consumption went down. Now, they don't understand very well exactly what caused what, what was the cause and what was the effect, and there's all kinds of hypotheses. One simple hypothesis is these kids, you know, were doing nothing, just sitting around all day, and it was kind of fun to get drugged, and so they did. Now, all of a sudden, there's something else to do, and, and just by the distraction from the drug consumption that looking at the art posed, they stopped consuming. Didn't stop at all, they didn't stop completely, but reduced consumption, but it was a measurable reduction. Another interpretation is that something, you know, happened to them while being exposed to this beautiful art. You know, for, for once, in their near um, sphere of um, acting, there was some beauty. And yeah. that beauty started spilling over and impacting their behavior. I don't know what caused it. We just know that this happened and, and it was a very positive influence. For me, it's a very touching um, experience because you know, it's one of the big problems we have in places like, like Argentina and art can be a solution. That's, um, I found it very interesting because it's, um, it was very measurable and, uh, you know, and again, in, in, in a very unexpected way. And mm -hmm. obviously the impact of uh, that kind of situation, I suspect would have been very different if you had had a television set put there, you know, like it, it, it's a very, very different kind of impact deep down. So the question from Selene was how the digital affects the process of buying art itself. I mean, I think it's already had a tremendous impact in the sense that people are still, um, people are, are, are getting inundated with JPEGs ahead of the show. People are doing electronic file transfers. I mean, I think the process of the, the buying of art itself, I think, has already been pretty thoroughly digitized. The process of deciding to buy art is another matter. You know, um, I mean, it remains to be seen. I think there are certain parts that can be digitized successfully, and other parts which, which if you try to digitize them, will actually undercut the process or undercut the magic of being part of the art world. One of the things, and I'm going to put it out there, even though no, no question was asked, that I think is really interesting is the extent to which us all living in this continuous task switching thing of being in the digital space and the physical space. I mean, I've got, you know, I've got sort of 10 active and 50 semi-active conversations going in my phone. You know, some of them quite interesting and some of them quite logistical, you know. Um, what, what's interesting is, is what does this do to our brains? What does this do to the brains of the artists? And what does this do to the brains of the audience? And I think, interestingly, two of the works that I think that I think of when I think of the digital. Also, I think there are three works that I think of. Um, uh, one is Amalia Ullman's Excellences and Perfections, which is a piece in which she used Instagram as a way to tell this narrative about a young, well, a young woman going through, through several, almost three different personalities. And it was a commentary <laughs> on the egotism and the, the trap that, that being an Instagram persona as opposed to a real personality has. And I think, 
That's a, that's a work which uses a very simple technology. Instagram is not, I mean, it's templated. It's not a sophisticated technology. This is even before Instagram video. It's just square images. And the reason it worked is not because of the technology she used. It's the fact that she told a great story using images and a little bit and the language of Instagram. Even less digital, um, or let's say slightly one step, one step less digital, because it uses an old technology, which is video, is Camino Ho's Grosse Fatigue, which was one of the great stars, one of the great break, break few pieces of the Venice Biennial um, a couple editions back. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, Camino Ho had a residency at one of the scientific uh, institutions in Washington, and she used that to build an amazing video which draw, drew on that experience, but also has overlaid spoken word poetry, has music, et cetera. And what's interesting about that piece is it's screen upon screen upon screen opening up, you know? And it's as if like a kid with a candy rush was just clicking on links. But we all know this experience, you know? Like you start looking for a hotel reservation and you end up like, you know, on your friend's page, you know, with all of their vacation shots. And then you have another window that's open with the music of that region. And then some third thing altogether, which has nothing to do with where you started. I would argue that Camino Ho's piece 20 years ago would have been so cacophonous, so complex, that the audiences wouldn't have reacted by saying she's the next great thing, but rather said, what is this crazy thing? There's no narrative to it, there's no thought, there's no idea. And I think the fact that we are constantly, you know, sitting at a desk with 17 conversations going on our WhatsApp, you know, a YouTube channel playing here, you know, other things coming in over our phone, you know, maybe a, a news crawl going, you know, et cetera, means that we're now used to, to being slightly invested in six different images and screens at the same time. And then the last one is a piece that, um, that I saw originally and that we commissioned for, for Art Basel Miami Beach several years ago called Meme for Miami. Now, Meme for Miami starts as a very simple setup. It's people watching a dance performance on stage. And then very quickly, the performance sort of refracts into many different performances. And, and the audience is dragged against their, well, without any control, around a whole building. And so you end up on stage, you end up in the wings, you end up in the kitchen of the theater, you end up on the balcony. And in each of those places, there's a different performance going on. And what's interesting about this is it's, it's very much, for me, very much a result, again, of, of the internet mind. You know? Like the internet, everybody was in that building. And everybody, in theory, could have had you know, was, was it, you know, those things were all going at the same time, but each person has a very different experience. And I think the fact that people didn't say like, well, I missed it, you know, I missed this. And they were just like, well, that was my experience in this building, and you had a different experience, and then you compared experiences. And it wasn't one narrative, but I think, you know, thinking about how the artist's mind is reshaped, because artists are part of society, and the audience is part of society, so we're all being rewired. And the question is, what does that mean in terms of the artwork that's being produced, and what does that mean in terms of how we receive it? One interesting, um, one of the most interesting, actually, experiences I had involving art and technology was um, actually an auction that I don't know why it went more or less um, uncommented. It happened in New York last, last year in Manhattan in the Upper 80th Street on Fifth Avenue by the park in a, one of those museums. It's, I don't know, one of the smaller museums there. And it was uh, by Artsy. Artsy organized the auction. And it was an auction of computer code, uh -huh. but as a new branch of art. <laughs> so uh, actually, Christie's had tried to run that auction, and Artsy outbid them. So Artsy, and every, every piece was sold, by the way. I was there, I tried to buy, I couldn't, I was outbid. There were 12 pieces sold, um, six to $20,000 each, and they were computer code. So somebody, some art curator, had decided that code, computer code, could be beautiful and that it could be artistic. And others believed it because 100% of what was put for sale was actually sold. Let me give an example of the kinds of code that, that were being sold. One of them was a um, very famous virus. Now, the problem with viruses is that they're extremely dangerous. So you could buy the pen drive, but you could never test whether the, 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 the virus was inside because the second you would connect your pen drive to your computer, it would blow it. So, so you had to believe the, and by, and by the way, the, uh, the, the artist uh, was a criminal. He, so you, you, we don't know who the guy actually is because he has a pseudonym because if he, if he knew who he is, then he would be caught. So 
It was a very funny thing. It was actually sold for $12,000. And, and then there was um, the, the, the initial hello code um, from 20 years ago and, and multiple. It was like a, a mini Rosetta Stone, a replica of the Rosetta Stone that you know, it had the, the, the hieroglyphic Latin and Greek sides. And then the other side, it had the code. Then there was a tie. You know, us techies, we really resent using ties. We don't use ties. So this was this tie. And somebody had actually written this very complex code on a tie, which is kind of an exceptionally, that, that would be an OK tie. You know? like, and, and in any case, this, for once I saw um, what I hear, I, I'm not a, a technologist, so I, I, I don't see it. But what I hear from my tech, my engineering, engineer friends, which is that code can be phenomenally beautiful or extremely ugly. And, but not, not very few people can actually tell that. I can yeah. see that. It's for a small, but for them it's completely obvious. It's the same reaction we might have when we look at a beautiful painting or an ugly painting or a beautiful building or an ugly building. It's natural, obvious, and spontaneous. So I don't know, maybe in the future we'll have more, it won't be, it won't be mainstream, but maybe computer code will be a new branch of art, just like video or pictures, which were excluded from you know, the art world for the, quite a long time. This and assumes that coders, the people who, who can read code in that way, yeah. are, buying, are buying art, yeah. are buying art as yeah. code, which yeah. is a whole other, yes, like yes. the relationship of Silicon Valley <laughs> to art is a whole yes. other question. Yes. <laughs> one more, one yeah. or two more uh, questions. Ladies first and then Olivia in the back. Yeah. So the, the question is, what do you buy when you buy code? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, well it's, it, 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 there were different uh, formats. So there'd be the stone, and there would be a tie, and there would be, one would be just a piece of paper, another one would be, be handwritten, another one would be the pen drive. It, it, there were like all kinds of formats. Now, think of it, what you buy when you buy a video. Sometimes you, buy, you can buy a, a, you know, a CD or a pen drive or, or an archive. It's, it's code, which you would reproduce on yeah. your screen and you, you have, you, therefore you have a video or a picture or something. Same thing here, you can, you can actually type the code and something will happen. Yeah. And it, but, but I mean, uh, the, but the, understand, this, yeah. is very, this is for a very niche uh, Yeah, but the, niche, the, the fact uh, that you had to make, that they had to make it physical yeah. still shows how trapped we are yeah. in this notion of art being an object. Yes. You know? yes. And I, I would argue that in the future, in the future, a lot of artists and a lot of art collectors will be more involved with art as experience than art as objects. Absolutely. I mean, every, every trend about, every trend analysis of millennials points to this. You know, it's a reason why yeah. people who have infinite amounts of wealth don't own chalets. They just rent one for 20,000 bucks wherever the snow is fresh, you know? <laughs> um, and I think uh, the digital will play a big part of that. You know, the digital will play a big part of people experiencing the thing which, which they aren't there for. Olivier, I think, is probably the last question. The point that Olivier Odomard was, was about a project by Theo Janssen called Strandbeast, which were these, these pieces that moved on, on the beach in Miami Beach. And the, the point was that a lot, of the, a lot of the coding was actually crowdsourced and put out onto the internet. And, and not only that, but also once the beasts were designed, that people could print them using 3D printers. So it, it's, it's actually, it's, it makes an interesting point, which is that one of the big effects of the digital is that artists are much less possessive of their pieces, both in terms of putting them out there, you know, um, but also in terms of, of how they're created. I think the notion, and all, already, you know, well, the old masters, but certainly Warhol and then now Kuhn's, point to the fact that even a physical object, which is sold based on its scarcity, doesn't have to be made by hand. But I think the notion that the, art, that the artwork is one person's vision, one person's creation, one person's physical work is only accentuated by the digital. Should we take one last question or should we go to lunch? Lunch? Okay. Thank you so much.